Genesis uh, chapter 35. So uh, Jacob returns to walk with the Lord is the uh, uh, title of the, the message. And uh, as we've come to know Jacob, and uh, uh, we're, we're all going to be very happy to see that he's walking with the, uh, with the Lord again. It's uh, disappointing when our heroes of the faith kind of walk away from the Lord and, and, and do things they shouldn't be doing, as it is our friends and people that we know. And it's always... Uh, Time of rejoicing when somebody comes back to walk with the Lord, and and uh, and we're going to see that uh, in the life of Jacob this morning. Well, let's pray. Father, we uh, just want to commit this time to you in your word and ask you to uh, take, again, this narrative of, uh, of Jacob's life and use it to uh, minister uh, to our hearts. There's certainly a lot that we can learn uh, from him, and uh, certainly we see your your loving kindness and your, your goodness and your grace to him, despite, and despite some of the things that he does and some of the lying, some of the deceiving, some of the things that uh, goes on in his life. But when he returns, you're, uh, you're there for him. And Lord, we, uh, we just want to learn from his life this morning. So pray that your spirit would use your word to encourage us, strengthen us, uh, Lord, and bring clarity to our own walk with you this morning. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Our, our relationship with the Lord is often compared to a walk. Paul says this in Colossians 2, 6. As you have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him. There's lots of other passages in the New Testament that make that comparison of our relationship uh, of walking with the Lord. The prophet Amos asked the question, can two walk together unless they agree to do so? And of course, that's a rhetorical question. The answer is, no, you actually have to <laughs> agree or you're not going to be walking together very long. Uh, the idea of walking with the Lord is that we agree to walk with him. We don't ask the Lord to <laughs> come and <laughs> walk with us. I'm going this way, Lord. I'll sure hope you'll come with me over here. No, it's the, it's the other way around. Sometimes the whole message of salvation is we say, Jesus is walking down the street this way and we're going this way. And we turn, we repent and decide to follow him or literally to walk with him. Jacob certainly knows the Lord. He has this tremendous encounter with, with God at Bethel and the stairway to heaven and the angels going up and down and God speaks to him and says, says I'm going to uh, protect you. I'm going to go with you where he's going on his way to Padan Aram. I'm going to be there with you. I'll, I'll be with you when you return. And, uh, and Jacob says, if I get back here with the clothes on my back, <laughs> you're going to be my God if you'll do that for me. And I'm going to Literally, and again, idea of spiritually walking with the Lord. Now, Jacob has done that to some degree. God's kept his promises despite Jacob's sin, but uh, Jacob returns. He got off track. He was doing the right thing. God told him, hey, it's time to leave your father-in-law behind. Uh, take all you've got and go back to the land the, where you should be living, uh, the land of Israel, called Canaan at that time, would become the land of Israel. Uh, Jacob arises to go, and on the way he realizes that he needs to try to reconcile with his brother Esau. <clears throat> the last time he saw him, swore to kill him. And we saw God miraculously move on in the life of Esau. And when they saw each other, they <clears throat> embraced uh, and so forth. And, uh, and it, was, uh, it was a wonderful scene. Of course, then Esau says, well, well, follow me. We'll all go together, and we'll go back to my home. And he lives down in uh, what we call the rock city of uh, Petra. Uh, in the Hebrew, it's Basra, uh, there in southern Jordan today. And uh, Jacob says that, uh, <clears throat> yeah, I'd really like to do that, you know, but, uh, you know, I've got all these kids, I've got the herds and everything, maybe some other time. And, uh, and then uh, Esau says, well, I'll leave some of my men with you to at least accompany you all down. Oh, we don't really need them. You go right ahead and pretty much we'll meet you there. And, of course, Esau leaves with his guys, and Jacob turns around and goes the opposite uh, direction, having just lied and deceived to uh, his brother. Doing that because obviously not trusting the Lord. He should have been saying, hey, I'd like to do that, but you're going that way and God's calling me this way. He's calling me to go to this land to meet him there. I have a vow. Whatever happens, I'm going to walk with him and trust him. He decides not to do that. <laughs> Proverbs says the fear of man is a a trap and a snare, and, and Jacob falls into it once again. He ends up wasting a lot of time. He goes and he builds a house in a place that's just referred to as Sukkoth. He's there for a time. He finally crosses the Jordan. He gets into the land of Canaan, 
rather than going again, the vow to go to Bethel, he goes to a place called Shechem, again, further up in the hills, in the mountains, more difficult if Esau came after him to come and get him again. And so he's kind of on the run. He's kind of halfway obedient. I'm kind of in the land, but I'm not really exactly where God wants me to be. Uh, and that halfway obedience, which is disobedience, then ends in some uh, tremendous disaster. We have, the, again, the rape of his daughter. His uh, older son's upset by that, rightfully so. They go in and kill every guy in, in the city. His other brothers go in and, and basically loot every house in town and all the women and the kids and the herds and their flocks. And Jacob says, great. Everyone else in this area is going to hear about this. We're few in number. They're going to hunt us down and kill us. Thanks a lot. That's where we ended up. And uh, last week in uh, chapter 34, it was a real edifying message. <laughs> but, uh, but again, we're, we're, we see the turnaround here this week. Donald Barnhouse, uh, the great preacher and commentator, says this uh, of the contrast of these two chapters. Chapter 34 does not mention God. It's full of lust, murder, deceit, and wretchedness. But this chapter, 35, is filled with God. His name appears 10 times. Plus once is God Almighty, El Shaddai. Plus 11 times in the names of Bethel and Israel. The contrast is striking, as it always must be in the life of a believer, living out of the will of God, and again when he returns to the will of God. God still loved Jacob. Jacob's belief system was intact. Uh, and so forth. God's promises were there for him. God had a plan for him. He was just choosing not to walk with God. And we, we know people that do that. Certainly it's a tragedy. They know the Lord. They've come to faith in Christ. And for whatever reason, they're deceived by the enemy. Something happens, an experience, and they depart, no longer walk with the Lord. And uh, when that happens, as we'll see with the life of Jacob, Certainly we rejoice when they come back to walk with the Lord, but often they bring back with them these residual effects of having been away from the Lord for a time. We're going to see those residual effects continue, at least through the life of Jacob's sons. Well, let's take a look at the first eight verses. The Lord once again directing the life of Jacob. Then God said to Jacob, Arise and go up to Bethel and dwell there and make an altar there to God who appeared to you when you fled from the face of Esau, your brother. And Jacob said to his household and to all who were with him, Put away the foreign gods that were among you, purify yourselves, change your garments. Then let us arise and go to Bethel, and I will make an altar there to God, who answered me in the day of my distress, and has been with me in the way which I have gone. So they gave Jacob all the foreign gods which were in their hands, and the earrings which were in their ears, and Jacob hid them under the terebinth tree, which was by Shechem. And they journeyed. And the terror of God was upon the cities that were all around them. And they did not pursue the sons of Jacob. So Jacob came to Luz, that is Bethel, which is in the land of Canaan. He and all the people who were with him. And he built an altar there and called the place El Bethel. Because there God appeared to him when he fled from the face of his brother. But now Deborah... Rebekah's nurse died, and she was buried below Bethel under the Terebeth tree. Uh, so the name of it was called Alon Bakuth. So uh, we see God again directing, and he's in obedience, and he is now fulfilling the vow. He made back in chapter 28, which again, if, uh, if you'll be with me, protect me, and bring me back at the close of my back. God's done a little better than that, hasn't he? Uh, Jake's a pretty wealthy guy at this, at this point. And, uh, and certainly the, the Lord's been faithful, so now he's going to fulfill this vow he made to the Lord. 20 years in Mesopotamia, uh, another, some writers say another 10 years, just in, in these last couple of chapters that we've, uh, we've covered. Uh, at least a decade long at the end there of just willful disobedience against the Lord. And we have the catastrophic results in terms of his daughter, uh, his uh, actions of his sons and so forth. But then God says, right when he thinks it's all over, and they're, even if they get to uh, Bethel, they'll probably get killed on the way, but he's going to give it a shot anyway. Uh, the Lord basically uh, protects him. Uh, when it says there in verse 1, Arise and go up to Bethel, the term go up suggests uh, 
uh, they're going there for spiritual reasons. It's a term uh, used with a religious pilgrimage. And, uh, and it's culminating as he builds this altar and calls in the name of the Lord. It's also interesting as well. That's, of course, the place where the stairway of heaven happens. That's the place he's supposed to return to. Uh, you know, Danny Lehman in his new book, uh, The Next Big Thing, talks about the idea of, of uh, it walking with God as though you're on a freeway. And sometimes you get distracted and you get on an off-ramp. And when you do, you need to find your way back to the on-ramp, you know, so you can get back uh, uh, going again. Not too difficult here in Hawaii with only three freeways, but if you're in some place like Southern California and you get off, it's very difficult to get back on. You have to kind of hunt for that on-ramp again, but you want to get back to that same place. And that's what he's uh, trying to do here. The second thing about this Lord directing him here, notice how he's leading his family in repentance. Uh, he needs to do that. They've been defiled in two ways. First, they were, well, they touched all the dead bodies. Uh, that they had killed, which at least uh, we know under the law later would have defiled them. And the other thing is they defiled themselves because they took everything that was in the house, including, according to the statements Jacob's makes, all of, the, all of the idols, all the foreign gods that were in the homes. They saw them as something of value. They took them. Uh, when it talks about the idea of, of giving up the idols and their earrings, it wasn't just jewelry. It was... Um, we know from archaeology it was a type of earring that basically had a, like a good luck charm and idol on it. So uh, what's good is that his sons all comply. There seems to be an immediate uh, obedience. They give him everything, and he buries it uh, under this tree. And then he says, we need to be purified. They do that by, by literally washing their bodies uh, and changing their, their clothes. And both of those things are kind of universal symbols for, for getting up. Uh, a new start. Uh, we see that uh, later in the life of Joseph. Joseph's been falsely accused in prison for a number of years. He has now an appearance before Pharaoh. Pharaoh says, make sure you give him a bath and give him a clean set of duds before he gets in here. In other words, if he's going to come in my presence, he needs to be purified. It was just kind of a universal sy uh, symbols. So this is pretty cool what he's, that, what he's doing now. He's saying that I'm going to now walk with the Lord, and he's doing it by example. We're going to Bethel. I mean, if Esau shows up and he kills us, he kills us, but I'm going to trust the Lord. If all the other peoples hunt us down and they hunt us down, so be it. But God says to go there. I'm going there. I want you all to come with me. Uh, so he's leading by example, and he says, and we need to repent. All this stuff, all these idols, all these things, we're going to do away with all of them. Our lives are going to be differently. Are, you, are we listening, dads, here? I mean, this is how you lead your family. You do it by example, and you say, hey, if we've been off track, I've gotten off track. I'm really sorry about this. As a family, we're going to walk with God, as Joshua would say at the end of his life in Joshua 21, 45. As for me and my house, I don't know what everybody else is going to do. I just threw that in. But uh, we're going to walk, uh, as for me and my house, we're going to walk with the Lord. And, uh, and that's what Jacob is doing, doing here. This idea of putting off the, the old, putting on the new, is something that Paul picks up in the New Testament <clears throat> to describe the same way. He uses it on a few occasions, but one of them is Ephesians 4, chapter, um, chapter 4, verse 22. There he says to us as believers that you put off concerning your former conduct, the old man, <clears throat> the old man is not your father uh, or your father-in-law. <clears throat> That's the old sin nature. You don't mind if I have a drink of water again. My wife has a cold, and in sympathy, I've got a sore throat just to kind of go along with it. Uh, the old man, which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lust, be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put on the... That's not really Newman, as in my last name, although it sure looks like it. But on the new man, which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. So Paul says, in walking with the Lord, it's like we put off something, like you put off an old garment, and you put something else new on. I put off my old sin nature that called the shots and ruled me before, and I put on the new nature that God gives me in Christ Jesus. When we come to the Lord, he not only forgives us of our sins, uh, but he imputes or gives to us a righteousness before him, and he gives us a new nature, and he gives us his Holy Spirit. 
we got a lot going for us compared to Jacob. <laughs> but uh, symbolically, they were doing these things, new clothes and the uh, ceremonial washing. Uh, we literally have the real thing here uh, in the New Testament. Notice verse 4 again. They gave Jacob all the foreign gods which were in their hands and the earrings which were in their ears. Again, there's a, a fairly immediate and full obedience by his family. Third thing about the direction is that, well, God protects them. Fear falls upon the cities uh, around them. We see that in verse 30 uh, of the previous chapter. He says to his sons, you troubled me by making me obnoxious among the inhabitants of the land. So he figures everyone will hear about the genocide that his sons have committed. Again, if somebody comes up to Shechem, all they find there are the bones of the men left in each of their homes. That's it. They did that and took everything else. And uh, Jacob says, pretty sure uh, they got some big brothers somewhere going to hear about this and uh, they're going to be coming after us, which they would have. But God intervenes and protects them as they're now walking with the Lord once again, being directed by him. And those directions included building an altar, verse 7. And he built an altar there and called the place El Bethel. Again, Bethel, house of God, as he uh, has that experience. He's running away from Esau, remember, some 30 years before that, fearing about what uh, the future uh, would hold for him, knowing that he's got a trek, you know, uh, several hundred miles to get uh, where his family lives. No idea what's going to happen, puts his head on a stone pillow that night, goes to sleep, has that vision of God, tremendous experience, angels ascending and descending on this ladder, and God speaking to him and so forth. Basically saying that you have access to me, and you have my presence and my protection over you as you go. He gets pretty excited about that. As he wakes up in the morning, and he says, this is the house of God right here. I met with God. This is the house of God right here. But it's different this time. He says, El Bethel, this is, it's, this is God, the house of God. The focus is different. The focus is the person and not the place. He was excited before about the place and about the experience. This time he's excited about God. And, that, and that's a very different thing. We were um, just talking to uh, <coughs> one of the folks yesterday as I attended my first little girl's tea party, which was uh, very exciting. Uh, and uh, out there with Matt and Jen on the base and Miley's uh, birthday. And um, I was talking to uh, one of the couples, uh, military folks that live on the other side of the island, and they uh, drive up to North Shore uh, every week. And, and uh, they were saying, yeah, we kind of did our, you know, search for the friendly church. And, uh, you know, saying, How, how'd you get from Eva Beach to the North Shore? And, and uh, they said, well, we just kept running to those churches with uh, light shows and smoke machines. I don't know what it is about that with churches these days. And we're kind of a little simpler than that, so we just kind of wanted, you know, like worship. <laughs> and uh, and uh, the uh, found North Shore Christian Fellowship and, uh, and loved it. Of course, it's a great uh, church up there with Mike and uh, Mike and Karen. But uh, there is a lot of attention placed on the place uh, and the experience, and not God Himself. And uh, and that's what uh, is distinct about uh, this expression, El Bethel. Jacob's changing. Uh, God's really gotten a hold of his life, and uh, he's repenting, he's leading his family, he's going courageously, hey, I'm going there, that's where God wants me to go, and uh, I'm just going to have to trust the Lord. If Esau comes after me again, well, so be it, but I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to walk with God. Uh, the uh, last thing about this, we have like this little thrown uh, in thing about Rebecca's nurse, uh, who dies and she's buried along the way, alone, bakuth means... Uh, uh, again, Bakuth means weeping or the oak or the tree of weeping. She's buried uh, probably, again, mentioned here for a couple of reasons. She's the transition between the patriarchs of a 180-year uh, year period. Uh, she is mentioned prior in uh, chapter 24, verse 57. And we don't know a lot about her, but God cares a lot about her because he mentions her here in Scripture. Did no miracles, never had a great ministry, but she was just apparently a very faithful person. Uh, and when and God mentions her here and remembers her here in, in Scripture, uh, and certainly the, the loss of her was probably significant. Jacob has probably known her uh, a very, very long time. But God is directing his life once again, and that's a wonderful thing. 
Uh, and notice as he gets there in verse 9 to 15, the Lord now declares the covenant promises uh, to Jacob once again. Verse 9, then Jacob appeared to Jacob again. God appeared to Jacob again. And when he came from Haram Aram and blessed him, and God said to him, your name is Jacob. Your name shall not be called Jacob anymore, but Israel shall be your name. So he called his name Israel. Also God said to him, I am God Almighty. Be fruitful and multiply. A nation and a company of nations shall proceed from you, and kings shall come from your body. The land which I gave Abraham and Isaac I give to you, and to your descendants after you I give this land. Then God went up from him in the place where he talked with him. So Jacob set up a pillar in the place where he talked with him, a pillar of stone, and poured a drink offering on it, and he poured oil on it. And Jacob called the name of the place where God spoke with him Bethel. So the declaration certainly confirms the covenant. The other thing that it does, it parallels uh, the incident of Abraham with God in chapter, uh, chapter 17, where uh, God makes all these promises uh, as well. It parallels in four ways. At that time, God changes Abraham's name. Remember, it was Abram, and he changes it to Abraham, or Abraham which means the father of multitude, which uh, might have been kind of a tough name to have when you have no kids. And you have no kids for a very long time, like several decades. Uh, hey, Abraham, your father of the multitude, can you come over here? That's a guy with no kids. You know, I mean, you know, so he's got the name, but, uh, uh, and certainly God was faithful to, uh, to give him the children and so forth. Uh, Isaac being that promised child, uh, uh, eventually, but uh, his name is changed. Jacob's name is changed. Remember Jacob's name is heel catcher because it has his birth. He was holding his twin brother's heel as they, uh, they came out of the womb. And, uh, and here he changes it to uh, basically fighter with God because he struggled with God there in the river uh, Jabuk. And, uh, and he was able in the end to lose. And in losing, he won because he's able to get the blessing of God. And as we quoted uh, from the Talmud, uh, the Jewish opinion of that is that Israel means that's the person who is trusting in God and living in complete dependence upon God. And you can understand then why Paul says in, in Romans, not all Israel are Israel. Not everybody's really trusting and living in dependence upon God. But that's the idea, and that's what his name means here. A change of name means a change of, of character. Uh, it speaks of uh, transformation, a change in destiny, because Abraham and now Jacob are, are walking with God. The second uh, parallel, they both uh, know God, and this name is uh, used, El Shaddai. Uh, means God Almighty, literally is how it's translated for us. speaks of God's powers, his majesty, and God's, uh, uh, God's sovereignty. Uh, the third parallel is... Uh, uh, in terms of the promises, uh, the fruitfulness, a nation, kings, and the promise of, uh, of the land, still disputing the land, of course, in, the, uh, uh, in Israel uh, today. But uh, we know that God's given it to the physical descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and now uh, Jacob. And, of course, the promise of kings coming forth would be through Judah, and eventually as uh, David would come to, the, come to the throne. The fourth parallel with that experience with Abraham was this expression, and God went up from him. So God was there with him. What was it like? Was God visible in some way? We, it doesn't really say, but it does uh, use these expressions that God talked with him, and God spoke with him, uh, and he literally heard this, this, the voice of, of God. You know, sometimes in the Psalms, there's these de descriptions of God's voice, like thunder, like roaring waters, uh, or being so majestic, and so forth, and uh, we don't know what it was, but it was a tremendous experience. But again, what he takes out of it was that, is that I was with God. It wasn't just the place. It wasn't just the experience. His focus now is on El Bethel, uh, the God of the house of God. And also he responds uh, to these declarations. Notice he sets up a pillar and uh, he pours, uh, like he did prior, uh, a drink offering, the oil on it and responds to uh, what God has done. There's a guy that's no longer self-focused, uh, scheming, half-heartedly following uh, the Lord. Here's the guy that's, I'm going to follow God no matter what, 
No matter what happens to me, no matter what happens to my family, no matter what the threats are, no matter what discouragement might come, this is it. I'm following the Lord. And, uh, and that's awesome to see that uh, in the life of, uh, uh, of Jacob. Now, the third thing that happens along the way here in this place that has uh, tremendous, uh, 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 tremendous interest to us because uh, his, uh, his wife Rachel dies. And of course, where she dies is the place where Jesus was born. And uh, the, the way that these incidents are tied together are very interesting. Uh, so the Lord allows, we would say, the death of Rachel to actually picture a future hope. Verse 16 to 20 says, Then they journeyed from Bethel, and when there was uh, but a little distance, not very far, we're talking a couple miles, distance to go to Ephrath, Rachel labored in childbirth, and she uh, had hard labor. Now it came to pass when she was in hard labor but the, that the midwife said to her, Do not fear, for you have this son also. And so it was, as her soul was departing, for she died, that she called his name Ben-Oni, but his father called him Ben-Jamin. So Rachel died and was buried on the way to Ephrath, that is Bethlehem, and Jacob set up a pillar on her grave, which is the pillar of Rachel's grave to this day. Of course, Rachel's tomb is, uh, is still there uh, in the land of Israel today. Uh, we'd say first that uh, the death of Rachel occurred, obviously, during childbirth. She was dying. Apparently, she knew she was dying. It was very expected. I mean, they just decide, okay, we're going to move on. They've only moved a couple of miles. And all of a sudden, she goes into hard labor. Uh, apparently, she uh, knows that she's going to die. So her midwife uh, is seeking to comfort her by saying, saying that she's not saying, I don't think you're going to die. She's saying that uh, as you're dying, Realize that you're going to, uh, to have a son. And she's doing her best to comfort her. Uh, and the, uh, the idea of that comfort was, now remember, Rachel was not able to conceive for a very long time. And um, when she finally did, she names a son Joseph, which means, the, you know, that added to. And she says, the Lord has given me a son, and he will add to me another son. And uh, the midwife is saying that God kept his promise to you. You have a son, and he's okay, and he's going to be born. There's weeping right now, but there's a future, and God kept his word. I mean, that's, it's like, you know, we read that and go, I don't think that's a lot of comfort that, you know, uh, boy, girl, I don't see that's helping me here. I'm dying. No, it's, it's saying you said this, you believe this. God said he would give you, and he absolutely has. God has uh, kept his word to you. But in her despair, she says, I will name him Ben-Oni, which means uh, son of my sorrow. Now, Jacob, who knows a little bit about uh, uh, having maybe not the best name, <laughs> give it to him at birth. He goes, I'm going to call my kid <laughs> son of sorrow his whole life. Hey, son of sorrow, how's it going? You know, uh, cry about anything lately? I mean, I, how do you grow up with that, that name? But... Uh, so he says, no, no, we're not calling him that. We're going to call him, ben we say Benjamin in English, but Benjamin, the son of my right hand, which has interesting, uh, interesting implications for, again, the other, the other son that was born here much later. Uh, the death of Rachel secondly occurs again, we said it's near Bethlehem, uh, and the place uh, in her death ends up playing a prophetic role in the birth of of Jesus the Messiah. Of the place itself, notice verse 16, a little distance to go was uh, Ephrath. Ephrath means fruitful. Verse 21, then Israel journeyed and pitched his tent right in that same area beyond the tower of Adar. Uh, uh, again, Adar means, um, means the flock and tower is uh, Migdal in the uh, Hebrew. So it's the watchtower of the flock. And as soon as we you know, translate it that properly. And if we always wrote it that way in scripture where we find it, uh, we would recognize that this place is mentioned by the prophet Micah. We're kind of familiar with that. Micah 5, 2, we see it on Christmas cards uh, all the time. The prophecy of this is where Jesus will be born. It's also mentioned by the prophet Jeremiah as, uh, as well. Uh, Jeremiah says this about this incident and what happened to Rachel what the nurse uh, says to her, God's, there's a hope and there's a future and God's keeping his word. That's the, the message 
In this time of despair, in this place, Jeremiah uses as an example in Jeremiah 31. The people are being decimated. They're being taken to Babylon and the Babylonian captivity. And this is an awesome chapter by Jeremiah where he promises the new covenant that we repeat and make reference to when we take communion. Jeremiah 31, 15 says, Thus says the Lord, a voice was heard in Ramah. That's, again, the idea of Bethlehem. Lamentation and bitter weeping. Rachel weeping for her children. Refusing to be comforted for her children because they are no more. Thus says the Lord, refrain your voice from weeping and your eyes from tears, for your work shall be rewarded, says the Lord. And they shall come back from the land of the enemy. There is hope in, in your future, says the Lord. Rachel, the mother of Israel, uh, is weeping because her children are no more. They're being taken into the Babylonian captivity. Jerusalem is going to be destroyed. The land is, uh, is decimated. And Jeremiah says, it's just like Rachel herself. Rachel was weeping. She had given up hope because she was dying. And that nursemaid said to her, God's word is true. He will give you, he has given you a son. And Jeremiah takes that experience and says, there's still a future. And there's still a hope for you. Don't give up Israel. God's going to be faithful to you. That's what he says then. Micah then picks up on the same incident and the same theme. Again, we're kind of familiar with the Micah 5, 2, but really the reference begins in Micah chapter 4, verse 8. Hang in there. Let me kind of keep putting the pieces of puzzle together, and then we'll try to bring this picture together. Uh, and you, O tower of the flock, that's our place. Again, uh, the flock is Adar, the tower, you know, Migdal, so the tower of the flock. We're, in the, we're talking about the same place. The stronghold of the daughter of Zion, uh, to you it sh uh, shall it come. Wh what's going to come? Even the former dominion shall come. The kingdom of the daughter of Jerusalem. Now why do you cry aloud? Uh, is there no king in your midst? Micah saying again in a time of great despair in Israel. Uh, and uh, maybe a time of weepy, weeping and so forth. He says, do you remember Rachel? Do you remember what the nursemaid said? Do you remember that incident? Do you remember what Jeremiah said? There's still a hope. What is the hope? That there's a king that's coming. And then he goes on and describes that later. Again, uh, in the original text, there's no chapter break. So later in the prophecy, uh, chapter 5, verse 2. But you, Bethlehem Ephratah, though you are little among the thousands of Judah... Yet out of you shall come forth to me the one to be ruler in Israel, who's going forth or from old, from everlasting. Therefore, he shall give them up until the time that she who is in labor has given birth. Then the remnant of his brethren shall return to the children of Israel. He shall stand and feed his flock. Jesus, the Messiah, in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God, and they shall abide. For now he shall be great to the ends of the earth. This one shall be peace. So again, Micah says that just like that nursemaid is there trying to encourage Rachel. Don't give up. There's hope. God's kept his word to you. You're having a son. Again, Micah comes along and says, uh, Jeremiah said that in that place there would be a place of great hope. What's the great hope? The Messiah. The Messiah is actually going to be born in this place where Rachel dies, where her tomb is to this day. And of course, then if you follow in uh, what we refer to as the, uh, the Christmas story, you get Joseph and Mary being required by the census to go where? To Megal Ador, to Bethlehem, to Ephrath, the place of fruitfulness, the house of bread. Jesus is the one that would bring the fruitfulness in terms of righteousness to people from all over the world, fulfill all the promises made to, to Jacob, uh, and he would be the one born right there. Now, the other thing that's interesting about this place is that this is the place, well, in their day, you remember the shepherds came and they worshiped him, and if you've been here for one of our studies, you'll, you'll know that uh, I've heard a lot of sermons saying these shepherds are some pretty bad guys, actually. I want to tell you, these are not any ordinary shepherds. They were in that same place, and they were watching over the sheep who all had to be perfect because they were the sacrificial sheep. They're five miles from Jerusalem. And those are the sheep that would be taken and be sacrificed in that place. So the place where the sacrificial sheep were born is the place where Jesus Christ was born. 
in the place where Micah said he would be born, in the place where Jeremiah said he is the one that will bring hope to his people, in the place where Rachel dies, but her nursemaid says, you're re weeping now, but God will keep his word. And it's all kept in Jesus the Messiah. The other part of this is interesting too, because of course, Jesus dies in the place where the Passover lambs die as well, all on Mount Moriah, uh, five miles away. Ephrah means fruitful. Uh, the fruitfulness of God will bless the whole world. Bethlehem, the house of bread. Jesus is the bread of life. Now, one more thing about their names, because remember the first name was son of my sorrow, Ben Oni, and that's who Jesus was as well. Isaiah 53, 3 of Jesus, he was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we did not esteem him. Jesus is known as the man of sorrows, Ben Oni. That's who the son was. Who did the son become? Jacob says, <laughs> and call him my kid by that name, and he changes his name to the son of my right hand. Who does Jesus become in his resurrection? He ascends to the throne of the Father where he sits at the right hand of God uh, to ever make intercession for us. One of the verses in Hebrews that speaks of it is in chapter 1, verse 3. Who being the brightness of his glory, speaking of Jesus, and the express image of his person, uh, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Jesus comes as Ben Oni, but becomes Benjamin. Benjamin. Pretty, pretty amazing. And, uh, and of course, the, the message here is that uh, in, in, in all of this, you know, the idea that certainly Jesus is our King, He's the Messiah, He's the one that brings hope and blessing to the whole world, and we've come to know Him. And, and uh, we always see the Bible as this integrated message system. We'll just look at it a little bit. But just to go back to the story of the heartbreak of Jacob of losing his wife that he loved. But even in that, God says, I'm still going to use this. This is a tragedy. This is a hard thing. This is a terrible thing. But uh, her death and where she died and the words that were spoken to her, I'm going to use this incident by my prophets and the birth of Jesus to bring hope to the entire world. Uh, I don't know if uh, Jacob, Jacob probably didn't know that at the time. But uh, there's certainly a lot of times where we face great tragedy in our own lives. And there is weeping, but as one of the Psalms says, there still can be rejoicing uh, in the morning. Truly, God can use all things together for good. And in this case, a place to bring the Messiah. So there's a lot, Jacob's life is being directed by God again. And that's, that's a wonderful thing. We want our lives to be directed by the Lord. God comes along because of that and begins to declare once again uh, his promises to him and even allowing the death of Rachel to bring a sense of hope and a prophetic uh, picture of the future of the Messiah. Oh, and then we turn a corner here. The divisions of Jacob's sons speak of their continual problems. So here we go back to the residuals, you know, residuals of, of a life really not walking with the Lord for a period of time, uh, the impact it had on the kids. Verse 21, then Israel journeyed and pitched his tent beyond the tower of Ader. Uh, and it happened when Israel dwelt in that land that Reuben went and lay with Bilhah, his father's concubine, and Israel heard about it. Now the sons of Jacob were 12. The sons of Leah were Reuben, Jacob's firstborn, Simeon, uh, Levi, uh, Judah, Issachar, and Zebulun. The sons of Rachel were Joseph and Benjamin. The sons of Bilhah, Rachel's maidservants, were Don and Naphtali. And the sons of Zilpah, uh, Leah's maidservants, were God and Asher. Uh, these were the sons of Jacob who were born to him in Padan Aram. Um, verse 21, verse 22. Uh, a little bit strange? What's going on here? Is this the idea that Reuben's the oldest kid? He's grown up. He's a young man. He's got the hots for Bilhah. No, that's not what's going on here at all. He does it very intentionally for a reason. Again, he's the number one son. Is he seen as the number one son? No, he's dirt. <laughs> Jacob's, Jacob's the man, <laughs> right? He's going to get that coat of many colors. He's going to get all the inheritance. Who's supposed to get all the inheritance and everything? Number one son. Uh, but uh, when they're facing the enemies, Jacob says, yeah, put Reuben out there in case somebody gets killed. Let it be him. I mean, these guys, you know, have been treated very, very badly by Jacob for a number of years. So 
Who's his mother? Leah, the, the first wife. The wife through whom the Messiah is going to come. The wife through whom all the priests are going to come. The wife who eventually would get buried at the tomb, uh, at the cave of Machpelah with Abraham and Sarah, Isaac and, uh, and Rachel and Jacob and, and, and Rebekah. Uh, or, or Jacob and Leah. So, but she she gets no credit for that. Evidently, this kid is kind of loves his mom or whatever. He's tired of seeing her being treated this way by Jacob. So when you have Rachel, the number one, dies, her maid servant, Bilhah, gets, does she get all the attention? Is she number one now? And Reuben says, uh, I can kind of I can kind of put an end to that right now. By going and sleeping with her, she now will be considered as a living widow by Jacob. Uh, right? He can never, he's never with her anymore. It's just, it's over. So Reuben, he does this strategically. This is not about his lust or anything like that. He's doing this to make sure that maybe his mom's got a shot at getting the recognition he felt she should always have. Everybody follow that? You got the same thing happening with... Uh, <clears throat> with uh, David, David is uh, betrayed by his son Absalom, you remember. David leaves Jerusalem and, uh, because he doesn't want to bloodshed in, uh, in, uh, in Jerusalem. And he says, hey, if uh, God wants me back on the throne, God will put me back on the throne. It's a great scene in the life of, of David. Absalom comes in. He takes the city. What is the first thing he do? Sleeps with all of David's concubines because I'm, I'm number one now. I'm the guy... I'm the guy in charge, and there's no going back. That's the idea. Reuben is doing this, thinking that it will keep Bilhah from attaining that status position within the family. He's also saying, by the way, I'm the number one son, and all the inheritance should be coming to me. Anyway, that's what's going on here. It's, a very, it's incest. Uh, it's a stepmother. Uh, it's a very weird thing, uh, but it's not what we think when we first read it. And all of this is, again, a residual effect of a, well, of a family with a lot of problems through a lot of years. Uh, and, and, uh, and Jacob is back. He really is Israel. He's trusting God, walking with God. It doesn't mean, it doesn't mean that all those years of being away from the Lord, that it's just, a, you know, there's no magic wand that takes away all of those, uh, of those problems. But, uh, and we're going to see more problems with, uh, with these kids as well. Well, how things work out for Reuben is a result of that. First Chronicles 5.1 says, Now the sons of Reuben, the firstborn of Israel, he was indeed the firstborn, but because he defiled his father's bed, his birthright was given to the sons of Joseph, the son of Israel, so that the genealogy is not listed according to the birthright. And that's what we have in this text as well. The genealogy is not listed according to the birthright. It's listed by, here's a mom and here's her kids. Here's a mom and here's her kids. Should be oldest kid, right? Right on down. It's not listed that way. Uh, later at the end, we made reference to Genesis 49, which is this kind of a, a huge, epic, prophetic uh, uh, passage as we uh, get to it. But he says, uh, this is uh, Jacob towards the end of his life speaking about Reuben. He says, Reuben, you're my firstborn. Uh, my might in the beginning of my strength, the excellency of dignity and the excellency of power. Sounds good so far, because that was his potential. But this is who he was. Verse 4, unstable as water, you shall not excel, because you went up to your father's bed, then you defiled it, he went up to my couch. Uh, nothing good comes from Reuben uh, as, as a result of this. Uh, very interesting. We've made reference to these kids and their names, and we'll, we'll get to this more in chapter 49. But remember that, that Reuben means uh, uh, a son, right? I mean, they have the first one, so they named him a son. And so on the, on the priest, on his breastplate, are the 12 stones with the 12 names. And the first one says, a son. And what does the last one say? Benjamin, son of my right hand. Everything on that chest is going to speak to us eventually uh, of Jesus Christ. He is the son. And he is the son of my right, right hand. But that's in Genesis 49. You're going to have to wait for that. Let's say, and again, the last thing here about this, the division, it's uh, seen in the way that the sons are listed. Uh, so there's obviously a residual bitterness. Uh, these kids don't exactly get along, right? I mean, these are the kids that are fighting with each other. They're young men, of course. By the time we, uh, we really see more about them. And uh, they're not real thrilled with Joseph. And, uh, and so they plot to kill him. Uh, and then short of killing him, 
uh, they sell them into slavery. Uh, so there's, there's a lot of residual impact of a, of a life uh, and a lot of years of not really allowing God to direct his life. The last thing about this, though, is uh, very interesting as well. Something we can miss. It appears to simply be the burial of Isaac. In the last two verses, the days of Isaac are ended with 180 years. Uh, verse 27, then Jacob came to his father Isaac at Mamre, or Kiriath Arba, that is Hebron, where Abraham and Isaac had dwelt. Now the days of Isaac were 180 years, so Isaac breathed his last and died, and gathered to his people, being old and full of days. Now, here's the un underlying portion, and his sons, Esau and Jacob, uh, are buried with them. One writer said this is, uh, Sarah's laughter was laid to rest. Remember Isaac, he's the little boy of promise, and Sarah laughed when he was born, and he now joins uh, them, uh, buried at the uh, ossuary at the uh, cave of Machpelah that Abraham bought from the, uh, the uh, Hittites. Now, a couple things uh, about their ages and telling us, okay, he's 180 when he died, uh, that uh, need to be pointed out, because it's kind of interesting. Uh, this, this is not given to us in chronological context. Moses, Moses kind of shifts some things up. I think he wants to take everything about, uh, about Joseph and put those all together for us, and we're, we're going to hit that here week, uh, week after next. Uh, and he takes this out of context and he moves it up for us. And I think it's for a reason. But here's the way that we, uh, we, uh, we know that. Isaac is 60 when Jacob and Esau are born. Uh, he's 180 now. Uh, so we know that Jacob is 120 years old. He lives to be 147. So he's got 27 more years uh, to live. Jacob is 91 when Joseph is born. Joseph is sold into slavery uh, at 17. So Joseph is a, Jacob is 108 when it happens. He's 108. So when at the burial of Isaac, Joseph, as far as Jacob knows, has been dead for 12 years. Right? That's what the kids told him, right? We found his cloak. Animals got him. Sorry, Dad. He's dead. As far as he knows. So, so again, we're, we're out of the chronological order. That's, that's my, uh, my whole point here. And I think that, that Moses does that, God inspiring him for a reason. He wants us to know that Jacob is truly walking with God and he's trusting God. Uh, he's gone through a lot. He's lost Rachel, as far as he knows. Joseph is dead, uh, but he's going to trust God anyway. How's he going to trust God? Because he shows up at the burial. Who else is there? Esau. What did Esau say? What was his big vow when he was deceived? He says, when my father dies, I'm killing my brother. Right? His father dies? What, was, what happened the last time these two guys saw each other? We kind of had this wonderful reconciliation. And what did Jacob do? He lies to him and deceives him. So the last, the last time Jacob saw Esau, he lied to him and deceived him. And the big vow that uh, Esau has made, when our father dies, I'm coming after you, boy. I'm killing you. For what, you, for what you did to me. If Jacob's not really walking with the Lord and trusting him, does he show up here? I don't think so. I don't think so. But he does. And I think Moses takes this incident out of chronological context, peels it back over to show us this chronology now of Jacob's life. He really is walking with God. And he really is trusting with God. And he says, you know what? I'm going there. I'm going to my father's burial and Esau kill, kill, kills me, he kills me, but I'm pretty sure God's going to protect me. I'm pretty sure God's going to keep his promises to me. I'm pretty sure that everything's going to be okay. I lost my wife that I love. I lost my son that I love. But you know what? God is good. This is a different guy here, isn't it? And we're like, praise the Lord. I hate it when these guys sin. It's just so discouraging to me. You, know, you want them to be your heroes of the faith, man. Get it together. <laughs> We say the same of those around us, don't we, as well? One of the things I you know, love about the, the men's retreats and some of the things that we do is because they're, they're like big family reunions. And it's, and it's an awesome thing to get together with somebody that you've been walking the Lord with the Lord with for 30 years or 30 years plus. It's like, all right, we're still here, man. You know, We're not grumpy old men sitting on the beach somewhere saying uh, how it could have been or should have been. You know, We're still going on with the Lord. Uh, and it's an encouraging thing. 
It's encouraging when we see it in the life of Jacob. It's encouraging when we see it in those, those around us. There's certainly a lot that we continue to learn from Jacob. But he obviously, again, sets this example. His message, repent from your sin, make it open and declare it, and, uh, and then walk with God. That's, that's, that's what he does here. And that's, that's the best thing. He's just straight up with his family, with his kids. I mean, could his kids at that point says, yeah, right, Dad, we heard that before. I mean, they, they, his kids are pretty cynical, right? And they could have been, and they probably were. But his, uh, I don't really care about their reaction. I'm just going to tell them where I'm at with the Lord. And I'm going to do my best to set an example, and we're going to go for God, and I sure hope they follow me along, which was the, uh, that, was, uh, that was the right thing to do. I was uh, talking to one of the guys at the breakfast yesterday, uh, Tony Dungy's uh, uh, first, uh, first book that he wrote after they won the Super Bowl and stuff. He kind of uh, goes through the, his whole experience playing football in high school and in college and so forth. And, uh, and it was a little disappointing. You know, you know, he was a great quarterback in, uh, uh, in college, uh, but never got a shot in the NFL because at that time, there were no African-Americans that were quarterbacks leading teams in the NFL. It felt like that, and that hurt him. But he, he got drafted anyway, uh, played for the Vikings, a couple of teams, had a career. And he says, you know, as a young guy, as a believer, I had to decide really on. And he, decide, he describes, you know, it's kind of, kind of tough to be that rookie and go through rookie camp and all that stuff. And he describes it all, and, and he knows he's really going to get kind of uh, hammered, and uh, the veterans are going to give him a hard time and, uh, and so forth. And he says, you know, I had to decide right then that uh, certainly like uh, a lot of cultures, the NFL is certainly a party and drinking culture, and he had to decide right away, you know what, best thing I can do is, uh, you know, I'm just gonna tell them all, I'm a Christian, I walk with God, I don't drink, I don't do these things, and I'm gonna take some abuse for it, but if I hang in there, maybe I can gain everybody's respect in the end, and that's exactly what he did, and that's exactly what happened. And as, a, as he became a veteran player then, he was known for that, and when guys had problems, the same guys that ridiculed him early on, they, those are the guys that would come to him and say, hey, can I talk to you? But he took a stand. And, that, and that's, you know, it's a hard thing to do initially. It's the best thing to do in the long run. That's what Jacob does here, and certainly there's so much that we can learn from him. Well, let's pray. Lord, we thank you for uh, the fact that, uh, like Jacob and with us, Wow, you just always take us back. Uh, there, there are the problems. There's the residual sins that come along. There's the, the repercussions when, Lord, when we make bad decisions because we're not walking with you and we're not being directed by you. But in terms of our sin, you forgive us completely. You put it away as far as the east is from the west. And, Lord, you just uh, react to us with your love and your grace uh, and your kindness. And it's a wonderful thing. Lord, we're thrilled to see that Jacob's walking with you again. And Lord, we're thrilled anytime someone comes back to walk with you again as well. Lord, I pray for anyone here that maybe is in that position or been in that position to know that, Lord, you love them greatly. They just need to take a stand for you. And Lord, you'll, you'll watch over them. Jacob had a lot of things he could have been fearful of. His brother, uh, all the other tribes that were in that area that would have been after him, but he said, well, I'm just going to going to trust God no matter what. Lord, and I pray that we would live by faith and not by fear. And we would look to you and know that you're trustworthy. And that uh, we would allow ourselves to be directed by you. We would truly agree to walk with you. We wouldn't just do our own thing and ask you to come along, but we would see where you're moving, where you're directing, and then we would walk with you. Lord, so we just pray that these truths and this example in this chapter would just kind of resonate with our hearts and minds and encourage us to take a stand for you when we need to, and Lord, submit to you that you might direct our lives, and we ask this in Jesus' name.